daydreaming about dragons. Let us talk about two words. And when I say these two words, a vibe is going to flood a lot of experienced gamers. A face might appear to you. For some, it might be a face. For some, it might be a mirror. Or it might be their younger selves. I've definitely worn this title. Ready for it? Here we go. Rules Lawyer. Mm. I was discussing this with Strash. Uh, a lot of my inspiration lately has come from after post-game conversations with Strash, either after playing Band of Blades, which is a game that he helped design, or after playing Blades in the Dark, Blue Coats, the Ghoul Case, and we, we kind of decompress for a while after the game because it's so intense and so much fun, and, and we'll, we'll talk about game design and stuff, and it's a blast. Me and Lauren and Strash will talk, and, and Strash is so full of gaming wisdom that I'm always in awe, and this conversation came out of that. It came out of a couple different places, so let's talk about a couple of experiences I've had at the table and how they led to this. All right, experience number one. I'm at a convention, uh, and someone, and I get a rule wrong. I think I was playing the Sorcerer RPG, and I got a rule wrong, and someone corrected me in a very, very, uh, maybe it wasn't very huffy, but it seemed very huffy. He seemed very taken aback and, and maybe even upset. This rule is wrong. Look, page 32. And I thought to myself, how am I going to, how do I deal with this? So what I said was, I was like, thank you very much. I'm glad we can get the rule right. That's fantastic. Tell you what, can you help me with the rules? If you see something wrong, just give me a, give me a, a, a gesture and I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll correct it. And that de, de-escalated the whole situation. That player relaxed. It was like, oh, cool. It's a good thing. I was like, it is a good thing. You pointed out something I was doing wrong. You didn't kill the flow of the game. It wasn't done in a terrible way. It could have been. And I understand that rules lawyer has a tradition, and it can be done in bad faith. Absolutely. Absolutely. It can be done in bad faith and be done poorly. But I would like to flip it on its head. And so that's the first story in which I'm starting to flip this thing on its head. Just beginning. Let's get to the other one. The other story is I'm running a game in college. It has nine people in it because it was college and I didn't say no to people because I was in my 20s and I was learning boundaries. That's a whole other talk, boundaries. All right, so nine people. We're we're playing Ars Magica. We called it Ars D&Dica because it was basically playing D&D with Ars Magica because I loved the Ars Magica magic system and a lot of the rules but oh man it was a hot mess all right i'm gonna come clean i'm gonna come clean daydreamers it was a hot glorious mess the kind of hot glorious mess that can only happen in college and it was kind of beautiful it was amazing and my buddy jay everybody else was playing human kids one kid one one person i think had some elven some fey blood But mostly they were human kids, mortal kids, whose parents or mentors or uh, foster parents were the greatest heroes of the last age, and now they're going out to make their stamp. Very simple premise. Super simple. Dead simple. Right? Cool. My friend Jay was running a dwarf, and he was definitely... And he was the one who like, came to get the kids, gathered them up Gandalf style, and whisked them away on an adventure. And I would like to talk about that role, okay? I, I like the idea of, and this is in Bend of Blades, right? So this is from a conversation with Strash, and Strash pointing out, hey, you know, I designed this for this. I like the idea of players who have different jobs and responsibilities at the table. I think that's damned interesting. I like the idea of, rather than a rules lawyer and talking about it in a negative connotation, which I think rules lawyer kind of has a negative connotation. Maybe I'm wrong. If so, you know, holler at me. Let me know. I like to think of these people as as rules Gandalfs, as Gandalfs. These are people who are going to help the less experienced people have a good time. 
because they know the rules, because they're willing to sit and look things up and then and get it out, because they're willing to play characters who set the other characters up for cool moments, right? People talk about what they want to play in Star Wars. How many say they want to play C-3PO or R2-D2? Other than me, other than me, I love playing androids. And I think the reason why R2-D2 and C-3PO, do, they set other people up for cool moments. And that's a necessary role. If everybody is just doing backflips and being awesome all the time, you, you can get numb. It's too much. You got to ease back. And I think these roles, these rule, rules Gandalf roles are really, really, really useful. And if we make them an explicit part of the game, be like, listen, these players are not as experienced with the system as you are. I need you to just kind of be on the ball. You know, we can even make the character, you know, make it mirror in the fiction. It doesn't have to be an exact one-to-one mirror. But if you've got a brand new player who's playing the young wizard, give an experienced player to play, to play their bodyguard, someone who really knows the magic system, who can look up spells and give them, give them suggestions. And maybe it's even in character. Maybe this bodyguard has been bodyguarding wizards for ages and really knows the spells. It's like, sir, you want to pick Fireball. Like, not for nothing, sir. I've been bodyguarding wizards for my whole life. If you have a third-level spell slot, you should, you should drop Fireball in it. Not for nothing. It's just conventional wisdom, sir. And it can be part of the game, kind of a fun thing. Huh? The, where, where the fiction is in this symbiotic relationship with the nonfiction in a way that you're doing, and you're doing it very consciously, and it's making everything better. The real world feels, fuels the fake world, which fuels the real world, which fuels the fake world, which is all on the table. Because you've got a rules Gandalf. You've got a GM, and you've got a lieutenant. Someone there to help you. The GM is the general, if you want to, you know, get hierarchical about it, cool to have a, a lieutenant on there. Even cooler, everyone becomes a lieutenant. Everyone just ranks up, starts helping each other. And then a new player comes in, someone else becomes a lieutenant, plays the bodyguard, plays the Gandalf. It's good stuff. In Band of Blades, this is a very explicit part of the game. There's a, a marshal and a commander and a quartermaster and a lore keeper and a spy master, and they're awesome. It's a really cool way. That way, the, the GM, who, and in this case, for this Band of Blades campaign, this GM happens to be me. For the next campaign, it might be someone else. In this campaign, it is... Uh, it's very helpful to have other people responsible for the rules. And it's all crystal clear. Hey, you're the quartermaster. You're responsible for keeping track of this and this. You're the commander. You keep track of that. Marshal, you keep track of this. Lore keeper, spy master, blah de blah I like thinking about making the implicit explicit in games. And even better when you can make it feed into it. So I was running another game with my dad and he and his buddy were playing Lords in Westeros. And they, this was this wasn't the, this was their first time gaming with me. My dad hadn't gamed before and his buddy Charlie had gamed before but hadn't gamed with me and hadn't played this particular game before. And I had my friend Wit play a maester, which is like a scholar priest servant in the Westeros world, in the Game of Thrones world, if you don't know. And it was super helpful to have somebody who's there to offer their wisdom and advice. That's what a maester is supposed to do. So I had an experienced player doing that. Wit got to be my Gandalf, and it was awesome. It was awesome. It made the game a thousand percent better and easier because I had someone there giving him advice in-game, and I had someone, and then he could also give advice out of game. And it just helped. It helped. How can we make this easier?
That's what I'm thinking about. How can we be better players? What, what parts of Gandalf do we want to take into ourselves so we can help the table get through Moriah? Fly, you fools. Hmm. All right. If you've got a good story about a uh, rules Gandalf, I'd love to hear about it. And let's get to Inspiration Goat. Good one, Inspiration Goat. Very good one. So let's take a look at Planetary by Warren Ellis and John Cassidy. And I got the Planetary Omnibus, which is a really pretty book. It collects all of the planetary team-ups, which are fun. And it's also just a beautiful brick of a graphic novel. And when you take the dust cover off, it is made to look like a planetary guide, which is kind of the coolest thing that any of these omnibuses has ever done uh, in my eyes. I, I am just in awe of it. So planetary is... Warren Ellis looking at kind of the history of pulp and superheroes and thinking about it and walking us through it with these characters who are not really, they're not, super, they're not cops, right? They're not firefighters. They're not, you know, Superman, Batman, Wonder Woman, or the Avengers. They're what he calls mystery archaeologists, which means they're going into weird th- places and recording them and putting those recordings together and making them available so other people can use them, whether it be weird science or whatever it is, or kaiju or whatever one, or ghosts, you know, of Hong Kong cops, whatever it is, these mystery archaeologists are on it and they, they record it and bring it back to their foundation. Okay, so how can we bring this back to gaming? I think there are a couple of applications for planetary to gaming, and they're worth talking about. The first one is the idea of taking a tour of a genre that you and your friends love. I think that's really cool. Uh, And I think a lot of gaming kind of does that, right? It allows you to step into moments of a genre that you like. You know, we're, we're playing... Band of Blades right now, and we're definitely seeing those, those, those war story beats that that you see in in, in all kinds of war stories, uh, and war movies, and short stories, and novels. I think that the way the planetary does it, though, is it's very specific. You're really taking you're really taking a tour. So, what would a campaign like that look like for you? And your friends, what fantasy signposts would and novels and parts of those novels and themes of those novels would be in your tour? And could you build a campaign around that? And could you build characters to look into that? Because the characters kind of have to be outside of it in a weird way. You know, they've got to be kind of sideways to it. They can't be, you can't have, you can't be taking a tour of everything you love about Arthuriana when you're playing Arthur, right? It doesn't, I don't think that would necessarily scan. Maybe one of Arthur's illegitimate sons, maybe someone sideways to it all, right? Someone who who never quite got mentioned in the books. So I'm just thinking about what that would look like. What does it look like to make a campaign that is a, a tour? But on the other hand, uh, I, to, in in my circles, having a campaign that's a tour guide uh, is kind of a dirty word, right? I mean, we used to call that back in the day. We used to call people who had games that with very fixed beginnings, middles, and endings uh, museum tour games because you couldn't touch anything. No, 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 don't touch that. Just go on the path as the GM has prescribed. So I don't want to make a museum tour game. I want there to be things in there for the players to affect and interesting choices for them to make, and an interesting antagonist for them to overcome. So what, what are they overcoming, right? Is there, in, in Planetary, there was a force called the Four, who were kind of like the evil Fantastic Four, 
who were trying to keep and hold all of the super science and strangeness of the world for themselves because they felt like they had been cheated of it. So they wanted to hold on to it. So what is it in your, in, in your tour that is the antagonist that is stopping people? I don't know. I don't even know if this game can work. I don't even know if this is already every game. I'm kind of thinking out loud about this. But it's, Planetary is such an obvious love letter to an entire era of comics. Um, and each issue is kind of its own little complete thing that I wonder, I don't know, I wonder if there's a way to game that. I wonder if there's a way to say like, hey, up here is like the King Arthur's inspired court and down here is Conan's Hyperborea and over here is Gene Wolfe's Sword of the Executioner and we're going to take a tour together. I don't know if that would even work or if they would all end up getting mixed up in a glorious way and if that's a bad thing. I'm not sure. Interesting. So here's the other thing that I think Planetary is interesting for gaming is the idea of a bunch of players who are trying to gather information uh, and, and trying to get the information out there, you know, whether they're reporters or, you know, as in this game, at, like this game said, mystery archaeologists, where you're looking at the world and all the strange things hidden in it, trying to uncover it. And show it to the world so that everyone can see it. I think that's kind of neat. I think that's really damned interesting. Uh, and, and I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think back to college when I was running a Deadlands game. And we had our game set in a traveling show. Not a circus, mind you, but a traveling show. And the... If I could go back, I would have changed a bunch of things about how I ran that game. Uh, but I think the the show part should have been more important because so much of, of the, the Deadlands setting was about overcoming despair and, and the heroes giving everybody hope. And I think the, the traveling show part could have been how they did that could have been one way they did that. And the other way they did that was having like, you know, a Scooby-Doo mystery adventure with every town. Right. So I, I don't know if, if you could do that, like with like, if you could just be running a newspaper in kind of a weird West, kind of interesting, you know, but would you want to report the news and then go in and change it? I don't know. What's the, where's the line for that? Maybe that's the campaign, right? Where's the line? between reporting the news and going in and changing the world? Or does reporting the news change the world enough? Or do you play characters reporting the news and then you make up characters next week who are inspired by that story and are going in there to change things because they have they think that that's just not right and something's got to be done? I don't know. I don't know. I just I read had a rainy Sunday with the uh, Planetary Omnibus, and it got me thinking got me thinking about how we could use mystery archaeology and the publishing of a guide to a world as as part of the game you know and if you had players or a, and a group that was so inclined could you like literally make the guide you know make it you know a blog or a website that that actually got written every week i think that's kind of neat it could be a lot of fun could be a lot of fun. And maybe the next campaign are the people who dug up these guides and are now kind of following up on what happened to all those strange things a hundred years later. I'm not sure. I just read Planetary, got inspired, you know, chewed it over with the inspiration goat, and here we are. If you have run a game that you feel is like a tour of a genre or a love letter, I'd love to hear about it how you did it, how you set it up. Uh, was everybody on board? Did everybody, was everybody in love with that setting? Or that genre or that piece of literature or whatever it was that you were, that, that, that the campaign was about? Or were some people kind of lukewarm and this was you showing them? Anyway, hit me up. I'd love to hear more about it. More info in the outro. 
in one second. If you would like to support the show, you can hit the support the show button, which is on the website where the Anchor podcasts are all hosted. There's also a link to it in the show notes. You can also purchase my book, The Dictionary of Moo, which is a science fantasy, swords and sorcery, vision of Mars, a setting book for the Sorcerer RPG. And you can also just drop me an email, send me a tweet, send me something for one of the the midweek reply shows. Let me know what's going on at your table. And I hope to hear from you. And as... Planetary, Warren Ellis and John Cassidy said, the world's a strange place. Let's keep it that way. See you next time.